Hey everyone, welcome to LV's Growth Equity Private Equity Investing Event. Um, obviously, we're thrilled with the turnout and the interest in the event so far. Um, today, it's all about growth equity, growth investing careers, right? Um, you know, as we think about it, growth equity is, you know, as you guys have may have heard already or seen, seen, seen in, the, in the deals that are going on, it is probably be the hottest investing sector within private equity and venture capital, um, and also the fastest growing, right? So it's what, you know, LBOs and private equity was perhaps, you know, five to 10 years ago. Uh, and if you're even remotely curious, you know, about what it's all about, you really don't want to miss any part of this event. We're going to cover it from a variety of different angles. Um, you know, the crux of growth equity investing lies, you know, somewhere between traditional private equity uh, leverage buyouts and earlier stage, you know, venture capital uh, and early stage investments. Um, and it involves investing in high growth companies at slightly more mature stages of capital or their life cycle than perhaps venture capital. Um, you know, typical growth rates for these companies are anywhere from like, you know, 20 to 50 percent, depending on the company. And many of the biggest companies you've seen go public in the last 10 years, you know, Airbnb, Spotify, Peloton, Zillow, and many more were all growth equity investments. And in fact, investments of the firms that we have on today. So, you know, in addition to that, it's also the number one hottest sectors where Elevate, you know, our audience wants to work in. So, you know, we're thrilled to have on three of the top growth equity firms here in the world, TCB, TPG Growth, and Warburg Pinkett. Um, we're extremely excited to have them on for our Elevate audience here. Um, one, to learn about growth equity from our professionals. Number two, about what makes each of their firms differentiated and special to them to work at. And number three, all about careers and recruiting, which you know the majority of our audience here is uh, interested in. Quick background, Elevate is the largest finance and investing platform for early professionals and students in North America. We established about a year ago, and we're now partnered with the top 35 universities, the top 10 MBAs, and all the top firms in the world. Um, with recruiting, networking, and trading platforms. Just a couple things to note before we dive in. Um, you know, Elevate has hosted the top private equity, you know, VC investment banking firms. Um, and so for videos for those sessions, you can check out the website. We've hosted some of the top firms, um, you know, in the world on the platform. So if you guys are interested in going back and listening to the videos of these sessions or learning from these professionals or frankly looking at recruitment opportunities, you can, you can definitely check out the Elevate platform. Our team will send out some of the links. Um, just to kind of get a sense for who's in the audience today, we've got about 50% early professionals and incoming investment banking, consulting PE analysts, um, about 50% undergrads who are headed into banking, PE, or consulting. We've got over 50 universities represented. And professionally, we've got about 60% in investment banking, 20% in investing, and about 20% in consulting and strategies, um, and 65% diversity across, you know, genders, backgrounds, ethnicities, universities, firms, and more. So really, really excited for this audience. And then for just to get a sense on the left of the 50 or so schools that are represented, and then on the right um, for the firms that are the most represented in terms of the audience itself. As far as today's session, right, the format today will be a panel with our firms and speakers. It's going to be broken out into four main sections, growth equity and private equity overview, firm overviews, recruiting, and then career success in the role. And then we'll do the panel, and then you're going to hear from the recruiting team from one of our partner firms here, um, TCD. And then we're gonna go and do a deep dive case study from one of the investment professionals who's gonna really, this is gonna be the most important part, I think of the whole session, where they'll go through and give you an understanding of how to think about the day-to-day -day work in growth equity and how to really position yourself and your background to work uh, you know, in both in a work setting and the interview, uh, interview setting. Um, finally, let's be very respectful of our firms and our speakers who are participating today with both their time here and after the session. Um, and we'll make it as interactive as possible. We had like hundreds of questions submitted, so we'll select as many of them as we can. If you have more, you can write them in the Q&A. So let us get started, guys. Um, let's start quickly with brief intros of our, uh, of our speakers. Um, I'll have Rohit, if you wanna kick us off from TCB, and then we'll do Tammy, and then we'll do uh, Sahil. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for taking time out of your weekend uh, to do this. Uh, that is a level of commitment that I, I don't think I had at your age. And so uh, you're doing great already uh, just by showing up. Um, my name is Rohit, uh, as Kaushik mentioned, I'm a vice president at TCV. Uh, and normally I'm based in our Menlo Park office uh, and I help uh, lead our investments in the software space, primarily in North America, but also uh, a little bit internationally in places like uh, Latin America as well. Uh, really excited to, to chat with all of you. Excellent. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, Tammy, you're up. <clears throat> hey, guys. Uh, good to meet all of you. Um, I would echo Rohit's point. It's very exciting to see all of you because we were 
in the conference, just three squares among ourselves. And all of a sudden we have 300 Zoom squares on top, so it's very exciting. Uh, so I'm currently a vice president at TPG. Um, I'm part of TPG Growth Equity, but also part of TPG's social impact investment fund called TPG Rise. Uh, our, as a lot of you guys know, TPG traditional private equity firm manages about $100 billion. And RISE and Growth Equity together manage about a $20 billion and will be in around since 2007. Uh, I spend most of my time in education and education related, related investments globally in US, China, India, and the rest of the world. And prior to this, I was at KKR's growth equity team. So if anyone's interested in that, I could be uh, able to share a little bit more about different private, private equity firms, uh, growth equity arm as well. Excellent, thank you so much, Tammy. Um, we have a, so much interest in sort of the the impact investing side as well on the platform. So I think some of those, uh, it would be really helpful. I'm Sahil Gupta from Warburg, um, who's a tech investor on their technology team. So Sahil, if you want to do a quick intro. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Sahil Gupta. I'm an, I've been with Warburg for around three and a half years in their technology investing practice. Um, what's interesting about Warburg is we call ourselves as a, we have a one firm, one fund model where it's one fund effectively investing entirely in growth equity. And that even that is very, uh, that varies quite largely from $30 million venture checks to multi-billion dollar buyouts, but all centered around growth. And then the bulk of my time at Warburg has been spent on um, SaaS and internet uh, technology businesses. Prior to Warburg, I was at BCG. So also happy to chat about uh, the decision to go into banking versus consulting and then navigating, going from consulting into uh, private equity as well. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. We have a packed agenda for the panel, so we'll try to get through as many of these um, topics. The first uh, first area, right, before we dive into the details, sort of what is growth investing? Um, Brody from uh, Florida, if you want to ask your question here for the audience to kick us off, that would be great. Absolutely. I really appreciate you all taking the time to meet with us. I was really interested in what are the kind of key differences that led you to be interested in investing in early series companies? Yeah, and effectively, like, what is growth equity? How you guys define it? Thank you, Brody. Rohit, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, uh, ha happy to. I think, uh, uh, thanks for the question, Brody. Um, as Kashif mentioned at the beginning, uh, there's sort of a spectrum of companies' life cycles, uh, and, and that starts with uh, sort of seed stage and venture, uh, and it progresses to uh, being a more mature business, having found product market fit, then progressing to, uh, you know, what we call go-to-market fit. Um, uh, meaning you've got a product people want, and then you've got a way of selling it that actually resonates uh, with the folks you're selling to, uh, whether they're businesses or consumers. Uh, and then uh, the business gradually matures from there to be more focused on uh, profitability uh, and, and expansion at a, at a more measured pace. Uh, and so growth equity really sits somewhere in the middle. And, and there are a few different flavors uh, of what growth uh, equity can mean, actually. Um, one is really taking, you know, venture capital to the next level. And so once you get past sort of, uh, you know, series B, uh, there are firms who are doing series C, series D type of investing, which really just means sort of the third or fourth institutional uh, investment into those businesses uh, that are considered, you know, growth equity firms. Uh, but that has more of a venture capital flavor where those companies might be growing, you know, 100% plus. Uh, and, and the goal is to prepare those businesses for uh, potentially an IPO uh, and, and success as a standalone public company. Um, there are other flavors of growth equity where uh, a business might have been around on a bootstrap basis, meaning they've never raised outside capital and are founder led. Uh, and they might be growing a little slower as a result because they are profitable from inception since it's someone's uh, kind of lifeblood in business. Um, and, and those businesses uh, tend to grow a little slower. They're a little more steady. Uh, but also uh, a really popular investment area for, for many firms. Um, and, and then, you know, there's a, there's a final category, which is sort of where TCB plays, which is uh, crossover investing, where across, um, you know, different types of, uh, of growth businesses, whether they're venture backed or not, uh, what we really specialize in and the C and TCB stands for is, um, is taking businesses that are at some point of maturity of having found product market fit and go to market fit uh, and helping them uh, figure out their next two to three growth uh, vectors uh, and do that with a crossover from private into public markets. Uh, so helping the businesses get ready to be public, uh, helping them actually IPO, uh, and in our case, actually continuing to be an investor 
uh, for many years uh, after the IPO. Uh, so how does that differ from, from you know, private equity uh, buyouts, for example, or venture? Uh, I guess versus venture, you know, our businesses, as I said, are farther along their curve. They've gotten farther with their product strategy. They've gotten farther uh, with their go-to-market strategy and sales efforts. Um, and and uh, they tend to be closer to understanding sort of what their profitability profile will look like uh, as they mature, uh, but they still have many vectors of expansion ahead of them. Uh, and versus private equity, uh, these are businesses that, again, are not at uh, full sort of profitability from a maturity standpoint, uh, and therefore from an investing standpoint, are really more focused on and priced on and evaluated on uh, how much growth potential they have ahead of them uh, versus how much uh, cash flow or profitability they have ahead of them. Uh, and, and what that means also is that the skill set is really different. What you're focused on are more strategic questions about the business, about the market, about the product, um, and competitive differentiation versus others who are uh, riding off in the same uh, macro tailwind, like the shift to cloud, for example, uh, in software or the, the adoption of increased adoption of mobile phones and e-commerce in the consumer world. Um, and, and so the things you're focused on are much more around the business and its growth options, uh, generally uh, organically what it can do on its own uh, versus private equity where there's a lot of focus on cash flow. Uh, the business is fairly mature. It operates in a fairly mature market. Uh, and the skill set is often around uh, how do you optimize the capital structure, which is uh, you know, the optimal mix of debt versus equity. Uh, can you uh, engineer the business in a way that delivers more returns to uh, the equity investors of the business, which is the private equity firm, um, uh, by using sort of clever uh, uh, financial structure? Uh, and it's really more about optimization uh, of what exists as opposed to maybe creating uh, new growth options. Although those lines are starting to blur and private equity firms are certainly getting uh, more thoughtful about how to expand uh, the addressable opportunities for their companies, even if they are putting debt on them and owning uh, a control stake. And, and that's maybe the last thing I'd say, uh, and, and I'll turn it over to the other panelists, which is um, most of the investing that you do in a growth context is minority. Uh, meaning you don't own a control stake in the business and that influences how much influence you have uh, over the business. And so you're really more a thought partner and a strategic partner uh, than a control operator of the company. Uh, so you don't re really see us uh, all that often uh, running big operational playbooks, taking cost out of the business, you know, wholesale replacing teams and all that stuff. Uh, that's not really what we do. It's, it's we try to partner uh, oftentimes with the existing management team. Sometimes we'll bring in new talent, but it's really more of a, of a partnership approach than a control approach uh, since we don't own a majority of the business. So, so let me stop there. Um, uh, hopefully that gives you a pretty uh, expansive uh, flyby, but Tammy or Sahil will turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Rahul. That was super comprehensive. Tammy, I don't know if you have anything I need to add on that. Um, from yeah, you have, yeah, I think that's a super, super comprehensive and that's a great answer. And I think in my mind, if you think about it, there are only three things um, that I think investors do. So that's sourcing, uh, that's deal diligence, deal execution, and that's portfolio support. And then to put it in the simplest terms, uh, so VC growth equity, private equity, the way their difference is VC in my mind, and the, you know, other panelists may disagree, VC tend to spend a lot more time on sourcing. So what you're doing is to build a market thesis go talk to entrepreneurs, figure out, you know, who's working great in their garage or Silicon Valley, somewhere in there. Uh, they do less on diligence because there's just not a lot of data with the early stage companies. On the other end, private equity, these are, you know, huge multi-billion dollar, multi-hundred million dollar companies. There's a ton of data. So you do deep, deep diligence, but there's less sourcing per se because Every private equity shop knows, you know, all the biggest companies in every single sector. So there's a little bit more, uh, like Rohit said, more financial engineering, more financial, in-depth financial diligence. Growth equity is in between. So depending on the firm you go with, there's a little bit of sourcing, go out there, figure out your market thesis, figure out the types of companies you work for. And there's a little bit more data than venture capital because you already have, you know, say like five, 10 years of data. So you can actually understand the fundamental unit economics. You're not betting on just a year of, uh, you know, pilot customer data. So that in some way requires a balanced skills of both, you know, people interaction, market thesis, as well as, you know, some, you know, a lot of folks here from X banking, X consulting. So you do require some, uh, you know, deep analysis on the company. So that's how I think about this spectrum uh, from my perspective. Yeah, I would just, I would add, 
as you guys think about going into buyout, uh, like late stage uh, private equity versus growth equity, um, what stood out for me is kind of what are the key questions you're looking to answer in diligence in growth equity versus buyout? In growth equity, I think we spend a lot of time on understanding what is the revenue opportunity. So that's laying out the market, the market size, what, what, uh, what are the number of jump balls per year and like how fast can you continue growing this business? And um, whereas I feel like my peers on sort of the later stage side, they are spending a lot more time on that operational playbook side as well. Like they're thinking through how can we expand margins from say 25% to 30%? And that's where a lot of their diligence is going. Whereas a lot of, I think uh, my diligence tends to be, okay, why do we think this business can continue growing at 30% year over year? What is the moat? Um, and, that, and that's kind of where a lot of the focus is. Yeah, super helpful guys. The only thing I'll add is, Start understanding for yourself, whether you're an investment banker now or sort of, you know, kind of going into you know, a consulting company or whatever, um, where are some of your own strengths and sort of where do you want to play? Do you want to play on the operational side? Do you want to play on sort of the diligence side or do you want to play kind of what Tammy mentioned, sort of a little bit of both? And I think that that's going to really help you understand where you will start excelling and where you want to sort of spend your careers in, right? So maybe that's just one other thing I'll add uh, from my perspective. Um, what, let's continue on the growth equity subject. Um, I want to get a sense from you guys on what are you the most excited, excited about in the industry? The last few years, we saw an immense amount of capital kind of flood in to the industry and growth equity to a lot of the companies that are supporting and the underlying companies doing really, really well. So maybe I'll turn over to a couple of our audience questions here on what excites you the most about um, growth and where we are in the overall investment cycle and what your outlook is. So well, the question was around what does the future of growth, the growth equity space look like within um, the various sectors that you operate in and sort of what is your outlook for, you know, where it is as it relates to valuation and kind of what, where it is going forward. Tammy, maybe you want to start? Yeah, of course. So I spent, uh, when I was at KKR, I spent time in general technology, both software and consumer internet. And now I spend a lot more time specializing in education. Uh, I think uh, what's super interesting about education, particularly during COVID is COVID just brings an uh, unprecedented level of opportunities into the education, especially education technology sector, uh, in both K-12 schools, as well as just lifelong learning. A lot, if you look at uh, just the sector in general, uh, the market is all of a sudden really broadened because schools finally has a device for each student that they've never been able to have. And because I'm also part of the impact fund, I do look for these uh, you know, software tools that can help help level the playing field, not only provide efficacy, but also uh, kind of provide efficacy in a scalable way. So that is, you know, a lot of people do it through software. So whether it's market size, market, uh, you know, the demand supply side, there's just so much opportunities in education. And also globally, if you think about uh, China, India, finally, there are great opportunities that again, leverage technology to level that playing field, not only serving massive, massive population in Asia, so a lot of money, lots of demand, again, uh, their ed education. Uh, I think, uh, so that's all the rosy picture about my sector. Uh, the downside, obviously, Rohit um, and, and others could probably feel it's just price is getting very expensive. There's more and more competition in growth equity and that brings kind of new challenges even though it's a very excite, exciting macro sector. Awesome, thank you, Tammy. Um, I totally agree with you on the kind of the intersection between opportunity technology and, and price. Rohit, I know you spent a lot of time on the you know, internet side of things and technology side of things. I mean, what, what's your perspective on you know, trends, you know, where we are, um, you know, what, what are the exciting things you see? Yeah, uh, well, I, I agree with and wholeheartedly resonate with everything Tammy said. Um, there's this there's paradox right now where uh, there's never been more capital chasing growth businesses. Uh, and on the other hand, the opportunity has never been bigger. I'm sure some of you have followed what's been happening uh, in the IPO market, for example, where companies are going public at, frankly, astonishing uh, values. And I think the, the consensus uh, in the investor community in many ways is uh, the quality of these companies, meaning how quickly they're growing, the value they're delivering for their customers, uh, their defensibility over time uh, is, is higher than really anything we've ever seen before. And it's almost like uh, entrepreneurs have gotten better at building great technology businesses over the last 10 years as we've really started to understand how different you know, strategic analysis and competition looks uh, when you're talking about internet scale economics versus you know, geographically constrained economics of building a retail store. Like all of the strategy books that you guys are studying uh, you know, in school and, and, and maybe you know, exploring in consulting firms 
uh, were written for a world that was constrained by physical distance and, and technologies that look nothing like they do today uh, when an entrepreneur can start a business and tomorrow instantly access a global audience. Uh, and so as a result, it, it really is this paradox where uh, valuations keep getting higher and higher. That's just a supply demand thing where there's so much capital chasing these companies. Um, but the quality of these businesses and their ability to grow for many years uh, and grow very quickly and become big businesses faster than we've ever seen uh, is also higher. Uh, so that's maybe one piece of the question, which is, you know, what are we seeing from a trends perspective? Um, where we are on the cycle, who knows? Uh, it's, it's always been a, a fool's errand to guess. Uh, uh, generally, cycles do happen. Uh, I'm not sure where we are, but it's certainly been a long time since the last one. Uh, and COVID was not at all uh, what we expected, at least for technology growth equity, where in fact it accelerated uh, a lot of adoption of software. It accelerated the use of technology in people's lives with things like telemedicine uh, and the adoption of e-commerce, for example, uh, almost doubling. Um, uh, and things like grocery delivery becoming a bigger fixture of people's uh, consumer behaviors. Um, and so all of those things were pulled forward by COVID, I would say. Uh, and, and, and that gets to the other piece of the question, which is what are the trends uh, we're really excited about? Um, I think we're just scratching the surface on what it means when you can access software from your web browser or from your mobile phone. Uh, I think we're just scratching the surface when it's easier than ever to build those solutions uh, and it's easier than ever to tap a global audience. Um, and there are lots of interesting ways that the basic premise of employment, for example, is changing. Uh, you know, we've been very excited about the creator economy, for example, where individuals have the ability to take their passion now and connect to a global uh, audience immediately um, uh, and build really big and healthy businesses that are way more uh, lucrative and interesting for them as individuals uh, than they would have been, you know, if they were working for a company. And so uh, I think that technology now is really beginning to show that it can rewrite some of the basic assumptions we had about uh, economics, employment, and you know, certainly we're seeing it in politics. Um, and, and it's just a very exciting time to be uh, trying to find opportunities. So uh, a, a little bit of everything in that response, but uh, it is a really, really interesting uh, paradox that we're facing. Thanks, Rafa. Uh, agree with both you guys. Um, Saho, your perspectives on sort of what you are seeing in this space, what sort of excites you uh, with where we are in, in growth equity and where we're headed? Trends that I'm really seeing uh, that are exciting me are one sort of the um, <clears throat> studio and streaming content economy. So that's like video game streaming or localized language content streaming, where there's real economies of scale that as you start getting a wider subscriber base, kind of like the Netflix model, it actually becomes cheaper per subscriber for you to create new content. And that sort of becomes your, your moat in that business. So I think the content economy is something that's really exciting. Another area that I think is really exciting is FinTech. Like as I'm sure a lot of people in this audience know, uh, anytime you're setting up a bank account, you're getting paperwork to get a new apartment and whatnot. It's a really manual and uh, frustrating process where you're wondering why isn't this digital? And I think there's a lot of exciting fintechs that are sort of um, innovating a very broken and manual process. So spending time in fintech is something that's really exciting to me as well. And then third, I would say is just thinking international. Uh, I think a couple different investors have done really well where they've spotted a great business model in the U.S. or something abroad and then apply that in another geography. This, this is kind of what, why I love this area of growth equities because you can you know, be a consumer of a product or you can sort of really understand the product itself. It's not some bespoke thing that you don't understand, but you're investing in companies and ideas that are really the next frontier of things that were done long ago, right? Like this is how it's been always done. And now I think the model is no, we, with technology and all these things, we could change everything and, and really transform the industry. And I think that's what's so exciting what these guys are working on day to day, but also kind of what the audience is looking at as far as their careers go, right? So um, super, super cool. Um, we're gonna try to go through a lot of, a lot of these questions in a, in a short period of time. Uh, actually, you know what, let's, let's go there next. Let's do a little bit of a firm overview. Um, I think maybe, uh, Tim, you already hit on this a little bit. Maybe Rohit, you wanna start and give the, the folks a little bit of how your firm is structured and Sahil, you can go and then Tim, you can add on anything else. So people understand sort of what are sort of some of the different verticals, how you organize, and maybe even how are you differentiated on deals that you bid on and, and kind of what is that proposition? Maybe Rohit, if you want to start. Sure. Um, so, so TCV, uh, as I mentioned, uh, stands for Technology Crossover Ventures. Uh, and so, so again, we are a crossover firm, which means we invest in companies privately uh, and then invest more as they go public and in their journey uh, as, as public businesses. Um, we were founded in 1995 and we manage around 25 billion of capital today. Uh, and all of that is focused on uh, kind of two primary areas. The first is consumer internet, uh, where we've been investors in companies like Netflix, Peloton, Spotify, Zillow, Airbnb, 
uh, and many others, uh, and then uh, B2B software uh, on a global basis where uh, we've been part of journeys uh, at Twilio, LinkedIn, uh, and a long tail of other companies. Uh, where we uh, sort of differentiate and, and spend our time uh, uh, sort of focus on differentiating is probably two things. Uh, the first, as I mentioned, is that crossover mandate. So when we partner with a company, uh, we tend to be um, their partner for a, a long period of time through their capital markets journey. Um, uh, we've taken almost 70 companies public uh, and more than 90% of the time uh, we invest more at the IPO. Uh, and then the second piece, which is related to that, is we tend to have a very long-term orientation. So uh, we invested in the Series B uh, of Netflix in 1999. We're still investors, still on the board. We invested uh, very early on in Zillow's journey in 2005. We're still uh, invested, still on the board. Uh, we invested in Facebook and held for almost 10 years. Uh, we invested in uh, Spotify, uh, frankly, just as they were entering the United States, we're still invested, still on the board. Uh, and so that's how we think about it is if you're looking for very growth minded partners with a long term orientation uh, that are focused on helping you compound your business uh, at really high rates over a long period of time and building global kind of category champions. Um, that's what we love to do. And that's where we love to get involved. Excellent. Thank you, Rahul. Um, obviously, amazing firms helping companies through uh, the, the kind of early stage and then late stage growth as well. So super helpful, Rahul. Thank you. Um, Sahil, do you want to give a quick overview um, of kind of how Warburg thinks about growth? Obviously, it's a it's a huge platform that encompasses different parts of, of capital. Like our real Warburg kind of by the numbers, we are over 60 years old and we're managing $60 billion under management and investing out a $15 billion fund. I think when people often hear uh, the name Warburg, they kind of associate with some of the larger buyout firms in the world, like your Blackstones and KKRs, um, just in terms of size and balance sheet. But we actually started out as a venture capital firm and growth is still very core to the investing we do today. In terms of how we think about growth, um, I think it's, it's probably not too differentiated from a lot of other growth equity platforms where as investors, we, we get excited about situations, um, especially in our server control deals where we call it the J curve, where we see a company that's maybe steady state in terms of delivering you EBITDA, but we think there's an opportunity to accelerate growth. That, I think that's very core to us being growth minded and helping companies go from, I don't know, say like um, point A, where there's $50 million in revenue to point B, which is $200, $300 million in revenue over our, over our whole period, which we're also given the size of the firm fairly flexible on. It's very patient capital that's along for the journey. So thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, that thanks for that color. Tammy, uh, sort of your pitch for TPG growth and how it sort of sits in the broader platform uh, and how you differentiate. Uh, yeah, just quickly, a TPG private equity firm been around for 30 plus years, manages about $100 billion. Uh, we have many multiple, arm, multiple arms uh, of different investment styles. TPG growth is one style that's been around since 2007, manages about $15 billion. Um, um, you know, investing companies, both on the internet side, the software side, consumer, healthcare, across the sectors. So the ones that people may heard of, uh, Uber, Airbnb, Spotify, Box, et cetera. Uh, I'm also part of the fund that is called TPG Rise, which is super exciting. Uh, it's the largest and the oldest institutionalized social impact investment fund. We're at about $6 billion AUM now. We started about five years ago. So what that means is we look at companies that not only have great commercial success, but also meet certain impact hurdles. Um, so in, within this rice fund, you know, we, we invest in companies in education sector, financial services sector, um, agriculture and food. It's really exciting across the globe. Uh, we also are targeting, this is public information, targeting a new climate fund. So this is a super exciting space. So if folks are thinking, if you like growth equity, but you also like you know, the social impact side of the deals, I think this will be a great platform for you to consider. Excellent, thank you, Tammy. Cut one more area on this before we jump to source on the recruiting and career side. Um, you know, we had a question from, and Michael, I'll, I'll let you ask your question, but um, you know, different firms have different approaches, right? And, and Rohit, you hit a little bit on that, on the crossover side. Sahil, you hit a little bit on that kind of, you know, throughout the life cycle of, of a company. You know, what has been your approach to creating value for portfolio companies? Is it M&A driven? Is it organic growth driven? Sort of like where do you guys, or, you know, where would you like to, what do you think about adding the value the most in terms of deals? And Michael, why don't you ask your question now? It's a good question from, from Penn. Yeah, sure. Hi, guys. Um, thank you for being with us like this morning. Um, so my question was just about like, what are some of the, the favorite qualities you've seen in management teams of like um, any portfolio companies you've worked with? 
Excellent. So like all encompassing question about, you know, deals you worked on that are interesting and also sort of what you look for in, in some teams that you've, that you've, um, that you've invested in. Um, just quickly on operational levers, I think these, this is no surprise for uh, the, consult the consultants on the call. So we look for both organic and M&A growth. In organic, you think about revenue, right? What drives revenue? So it's new product, it's adding new sales rep. Usually that has an almost linear relationship to your revenue growth. Uh, it is to you know drive upsell, cross sell, uh, drive price increase, et cetera. And then uh, on the M&A side, we look for M&A for new products, new regions, uh, you, within US, internationally. So those are things that we all consider. Uh, we do look at a lot of deals. We do look at what we call low hanging fruits. So if the company has historically been undermanaged, for example, in their, uh, you know, we have a company that has been spending all of their marketing on billboards. I mean, this is 20, 2021, right? So we should definitely can help them invest marketing in a more effective way on digital marketing, you know, to be more targeted, drive their conversion, et cetera. Uh, so go to market is another one. Um, so that's one. This is just this is a long story short. There's a long list of things our ops team will look at to drive growth in companies. In terms of what has a management team, it really depends. Uh, we invest in kind of typical Silicon Valley uh, founder founded founded a company out of their storm type of investors. Uh, you know, founders. We also invest in uh, you know it, CEOs who have came from other private equity backed. Uh, opportunities who have done M&A before, who has a track record. So it really depends on the situation. I think. Excellent. Thanks, Amy. Um, uh, Sahil, from your end. I think on sort of the the value add that we're adding outside of just capital, I, I actually think it's a lot of a lot of repeat of what Tammy's saying, where when we invest in a business, we're, we're really looking to partner with the management team, be it whether we're majority or minority, but we're going to board meetings and trying to be very collaborative. And we offer a lot of resources that are kind of free of use and on management's discretion if they want to use them in, uh, in, in the form of like consultants who have had a lot of operating experience before. So this can be like someone who is a pricing expert, someone who's a go-to-market expert. Uh, we'll often take a lot of the M&A responsibilities on ourselves. Uh, we'll have people who have a lot of new product experience go in. So uh, why that's important to a founder is just having a sounding board of people uh, they can work with. I think that's something they really appreciate. Um, in terms of favorite qualities of management teams, uh, I think I underappreciated just how much reference checking is done when we are investing in a business. This isn't just like your standard background check. This is like talking to people who have worked with that management team. Uh, because at the end of the day, you are signing up for a five, seven year marriage with this management team. So you want it, you want it to be someone you can gel with and get along with and trust. Um, and I think that this is not just when you are uh, investing in the business, but also I think just sitting in boardroom meetings, I realize a lot of uh, senior leadership at companies, a lot of their role is just building out a team, uh, thinking through like, hey, I needed a good CPO. This is what this person's strong in. This is where we could supplement them in. But, um, and a lot of how we come to those decisions is through a mix of like reference checking and whatnot. Um, so I think that that's something that I realized when we look for, when we, what we look for in management teams is just, do they have a great track record of people who love working with them? That's super important. I mean, it's ultimately a people business, a talent business, right? In any way that you're investing in and helping people succeed, um, whether it's capital or connections. So, so thanks, Al, for that. Um, and Rohit, from your end, on sort of the differentiators, um, operating levers, or yeah, absolutely. Um, I, on the operational lever side, um, I guess we certainly, not to echo uh, uh, Tammy and Sile, but we would sort of emphasize all the same things around go-to-market, uh, pricing and packaging, you know, you're delivering a valuable service to your customers. Are there ways for you to align uh, your value creation to, to theirs uh, a little bit more effectively? Uh, but the biggest thing I would say is, you know, we are a 26-year-old firm that's really steeped in Silicon Valley. Uh, and as a result, the network of the firm is, is pretty uh, strong around uh, people who have seen very parallel situations to what you're working on. It's because we've got this pattern recognition uh, from investing in so many, uh, you know, uh, fortunately great uh, software and internet businesses over time. Uh, we're able to kind of find like that killer executive um, from a talent perspective. Uh, and maybe that's the bridge to, to what we look for in talent, which is uh, kind of two things. Um, and the first is because of what we're trying to do, which is build really big category creating or category defining businesses uh, over time, sort of the Netflixes and Pelotons of the world. Um, we absolutely love CEOs who are huge visionaries uh, and clearly, you know, have this ability to see around corners 
uh, for where their market is headed and where consumer behavior is headed. Um, and, and so that's the first thing is just vision and sort of, frankly, ambition um, and, and sort of the intensity that accompanies that. And then the second is what Simon mentioned, which is uh, what we describe as talent gravity, which is, are they able to attract uh, absolute killers to go do exactly what they need to go do? And oftentimes a great leading indicator for that is, did they bring people from past ventures to join them? You know, is this the type of person uh, who uh, past employees would say, if they ever started something, I would join them in a heartbeat. Uh, and so a lot of that kind of talent gravity uh, is really important to us as well. Excellent, thank you guys. Super, super. Uh, I think I think nothing else to add from my end. I think you guys described really well. Let's get to the the next piece, which is recruiting, which I think a lot of our audience is obviously going to be interested in uh, into these types of careers. We've had a lot of questions come in, like I mentioned. You guys want to put more questions in? You can either message our team, me, or in in the chat group. But let's just break down this into like different pro you know parts of the process itself. And I'd love to get you guys' thoughts on on the whole process. First of all, at a high level, sort of what types of candidates, right, at the associate level, which the majority of the folks who are professionals might be go going in associate. So let's think about early, you know, early career, you know, internships or analyst associate level. Sort of what are the types of candidates um, that are successful at your firm? A happy start. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you guys know how kind of the on-site review process works. It's very fast and whatnot. Um, at Warburg, I think our interview process is pretty similar to what it would be at a lot of other private equity firms where it's a modeling test. Um, and then you have a few in-person interviews where it's a mix of behavioral and technical questions. And I'm not sure there's that many firms that are, that are super unique in their interview process. Uh, and then, you know, at a firm like Warburg, where uh, you're, uh, especially in the tech group where it's very growth equity focused, I would say the, your role is kind of uh, like Tammy mentioned, you're doing sourcing, you're doing deal execution, and you're doing portfolio management. Um, I think at a place like Warburg, where a lot of people have sort of buy, buy backgrounds, having that deal execution, that technical analytical skill set is just table stakes. Like, I, I just feel like finance is a place where if you mess up a number or aren't able to deliver, deliver on the analysis, that's something people take very seriously. Um, and that scares them away because that's sort of a skill that they want you to have. And that's a responsibility they kind of want to outsource to you. Um, and then the sourcing side, that's, I think, kind of second in sort of your, your success, not in, not in terms of importance, but just in terms of, uh, yeah, I think it's harder to grade someone on sourcing than it is on just a, a purely analytical task. But uh, someone that is outgoing, that's like hungry and creative on okay, what's an interesting business? What's an interesting way to get in touch with this business? You have to be very outgoing. Like if you're someone that just likes to crank out models all day and uh, be an Excel ninja, then uh, growth probably isn't the most perfect place for you. Uh, but if you're someone that likes going, that it's a little bit extra and likes going out to meet with management teams and think through like, why is this business interesting? Why is this not interesting? I think that's where you'll really enjoy growth. So those are the two things um, I would say. The third is actually, I think, being, being really friendly with portfolio management teams and being able to build a good relationship. Like I said, our hold periods tend to be oftentimes longer than five years. Uh, so it's a very long hold period. And then also, when you, like Rod said, you're looking for people that are killers or can attract killers. Once you find that sort of individual, you wanna work with them day in and day out, um, even on future deals. So being able to establish a strong rapport with management teams, I think, and build your credibility is super important as well. Awesome, thank awesome. you. Uh, before we let other, uh, do you want to do a quick intro and do your, ask your question for the panel and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue on the recruiting topic. Sure. Um, so just want to thank you guys for taking some time to uh, talk to us here today. I just graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and, we, and we'll be working at Goldman um, and starting in two weeks, so coming up pretty fast. But um, so, so, so along other lines of just um, recruiting and, you know, all the, all the skill sets that are necessary to do well in the process. I was pretty curious actually to see for you guys what worked well when transitioning from you know the banking and consulting role over to the investing role and what skill sets um, helped you particularly when transitioning both in, in the recruiting process and also on, on the job. And uh, thank you. Tammy, do you wanna take that one and then we'll go to Rohit. Yeah, I think um, I agree with Sahil's point. So it's fairly standard uh, interview process, behavior interview, leadership, and then um, technical interviews. I think there are three things that if you're interested in growth that you absolutely have to do. One is, as Sahil mentioned, you have to um, you know, be 100% strong on your technicals, on the ability to build a model. Um, and this is two parts. So one is 
you have to be able to build an LBO model. Um, just that ability to uh, thinking through to think through cash flow is super important, uh, no matter what type of growth equity firm you're going to be in. Two, and perhaps more important, you have to be able to think through revenue built. And um, in banking, usually it's just oh, revenue that's growing by 15%, 13%, 10%, 8% every year. That's definitely that's definitely a no no in all these growth equity interviews. You want to think through the drivers. Is that price? Is that volume? Is it price volume by product? How will price uh, grow over time? How will volume grow over time based on the broader market dynamics? So I want you to be able to build um, a very thoughtful revenue model. And that could be price volume, that could be number of sales force, um, quota, productivity, et cetera. In real life, our associates probably build like 300 rows in order to get that one revenue line because we think really deep on the key drivers that will go wrong. Uh, so that is one, is the ability to think through model very thoughtfully. That second is, I would love for all of you to uh, pick a sector that you're very interested in and find one to two uh, kind of growth stage opportunities that you wanna to pitch to the company. Uh, that is super important. It shows that you are interested in a sector. It shows that you are proactive with uh, quote unquote sourcing, but also in the process of developing this, you should develop a quote unquote investment framework. Uh, is that the market, competitive dynamics, uh, product differentiation, management, exit opportunity, et cetera. So I want you to build that and be able to talk through it during growth equity. That's very important compared to like what you're doing banking. In banking, you probably put together a sell side pitch. Keep in mind, bankers are there to sell. So a lot of their things are, if you're on the buy side, you put on a super suspicious like hat on top of everything bankers say. So when you come to the growth equity interview, it's not to paraphrase what you wrote on your sins. It's to say, okay, I wrote this, but I don't, I disagree because I think there's a risk here. So it's to be super uh, balance in your thinking. Uh, the third thing uh, is sourcing. It depends on the firm. You should really talk to the firm. At TPG, associates do less sourcing. At KKR, associates do a lot more sourcing. So you should, it's not the firm. KKR and TPG are both private equity firms, but it's the team's DNA are very different. So really talk to the folks and think about how much uh, sourcing versus technicals you need in each role and then kind of cater your answers a little bit differently based on what the firm is trying to look for. That's a great answer. Um, I think exactly right. I too went from banking to, uh, to private equity and investing. I think you go from saying yes to saying no. So to Tammy's point, like as an investor, you're kind of saying, all right, what are the things that could go wrong such that, you know, I'm going to be an investor in this company for the long term. So could not agree more. And actually guys, anyone, hopefully people have been taking notes because she just laid out like an amazing framework of like how to think about interviews and how do you, you know, uh, s s structure your answers as it relates to case studies and so on. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Tammy, for doing that. Um, Robert, in addition to that, like should professionals be networking or should, should students or candidates be networking um, ahead and sort of what's the right framework to think about that? Yeah, uh, maybe let, let me just start there. So uh, the, the way I think about it is uh, networking is a really useful way of covering the first third of the journey, which is, uh, maybe getting to the interview uh, and making sure that you're on the radar of the firm and you've expressed a lot of interest and uh, you've left folks at the firm with a good impression. Uh, I, and I would say tactically, uh, if you can have multiple touch points uh, within a firm that will only behoove you. Um, and the thing that I always like to say about recruiting and networking generally is it's sort of an underrated opportunity to build your own personal network. Um, and so, so as you go through this whole exercise, uh, there are lots of folks you know, in my past when I was recruiting for associate roles uh, who were at firms that either didn't want to hire me or I didn't want to work at ultimately, uh, but who are still uh, great sort of contacts to have in the industry. And, and this world gets really small uh, really quickly, particularly as you get, you know, five and 10 years out of college. Um, so, so I would think of networking as number one, sort of useful in its own right. And number two, as really in the context of recruiting, uh, mostly for that first third of the journey, which is getting to the interview. And again, try to have multiple touch points uh, within the firm. Uh, and then the last point on that is, uh, a great way to do that tactically is just to end every conversation with a firm by saying, uh, hey, is there anyone else at your firm that I, that I could speak with or, or maybe even come prepared to say, would you be comfortable making an introduction to X, Y, Z um, and, and try to build a little bit of a, a momentum and cadence there. Um, and then the second third of the recruiting process is, is sort of the uh, uh, the, um, uh, the preparation piece that Tammy mentioned, where uh, I would agree with uh, you know everything she said, uh, where 
Uh, technicals are table stakes. I think you're expected to come and do the job and use numbers to discipline uh, reality. I would say though, um, it's not table stakes in the sense of being intense or scary. It's more like uh, you should just understand why we build models, which is to try to apply some kind of quantitative discipline to the assumptions we're making about the future, uh, which is really hard to know. And, and so as an investor, uh, when you're thinking in probabilities, when, uh, the model can be a very useful way uh, of, of laying that out. Uh, it's actually not where you should stop though, um, which gets to sort of the third thing, uh, which is investment judgment. And so you guys are, you know, 20, 22, you know, maybe 24 or something like that. And, and so I imagine most of you have not been in principal investing roles yet where you've had to risk uh, capital. Um, but, but what we're looking for really uh, is investment judgment, meaning do you have the ability to look at a situation where you might be able to invest money and say, this is a good investment or a bad investment because X, Y, Z. And, and really what that's about is seeing the world very clearly and asking the right questions to understand what are the things that really matter, right? If you're, if you're investing in a certain type of business, the thing that really matters might be the unit economics. Can this company scalably and repeatably and profitably grow? Uh, in another situation, it might be a regulatory risk. And in a third situation, it might be really about uh, honing in on a key issue uh, around competition. And what we're looking for is your ability to build a mental model of uh, that investment situation and then tell us in a clear and simple way uh, why we should or should not invest. And so a case study will naturally be part of that. Uh, but, but really what we're focused on more is how do you think uh, and are you able to take a situation and digest it from first principles? Um, and then maybe the other big thing for us at TCV at least is uh, a lot of the times we are dreaming alongside uh, the founders that we back and again, creating or uh, building categories or redefining categories. Uh, and I mentioned that vision point earlier. Uh, a lot of times what that requires is intellectual curiosity uh, to really understand deeply uh, why a piece of technology that has changed will create new opportunity or why uh, you know, these subtle things like uh, a service being you know, 10 or 15% cheaper in the consumer world might actually really tip consumer demand. Uh, and so there's this creativity and intellectual curiosity that's really, really important in what we look for. Uh, and ultimately we would love for our associates to be thought partners more than resources. Um, and and that's, uh, that's sort of our ethos in, in approaching the recruiting process as well. Um, I don't know if that answers uh, uh, the question per se, Kashik, but uh, uh, that's where I'll do it. I was, no, was super comprehensive. And in the, I know we're kind of going all across the board in terms of depth, the breadth of topics we're trying to capture, but I think, you know, we, you know, just in the interest of having amazing panelists, we want to get through as many of these topics. But Rohit, that's super, super helpful. Um, well, quick time check. We're at, we're at 10 o'clock or 1 o'clock um, for folks. We're going to do the panel for another couple minutes, and then we're going to have our firm-specific overview and then the case study that's going to be presented by Alex, who's going to go through um, one of the, the, the deals that he worked on. So um, uh, I think it's going to be really, really exciting for our, our people to hear about what the associate does on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of diligence, et cetera. I want to get to maybe a couple of rapid fire questions with you guys before I, you know, before, uh, you know, we, we um, do this um, on the recruiting side, you know, banking or consulting versus investing. This is for my undergraduate audience, um, banking or consulting versus investing right after undergrad. Any thoughts on that guys? Anyone can kind of jump in here. Any, any career would lead you into becoming an associate in growth equity. So all of about, it's about how you like the market, how they're technical, um, whether you have strong investment thesis. Understood. And I think we've noticed a lot more where our audience, where, you know, there's maybe a larger portion of the people that are going into, you know, PE or growth or VC, like right out of undergrad, even before doing their banking and consulting stint. And so that's something that we're seeing. But yeah, Sahil, you came from a consulting background, so that gave you a little bit of a different perspective. You can comment on that maybe really. I, I agree with Tammy, all of the above. Maybe there's there's a world where if if you're graduating from undergrad and you're really interested in product or operations or um, something along those lines, consulting maybe gives you a little bit more exposure to that. But I feel like if you go into banking or private equity right out of undergrad, you're still getting a great skill set. It's it's very easy to make that pivot. I don't think one closes. I, I think if you do consulting and say want to go into distressed debt investing, that's a, probably a harder transition. But if you came to the growth equity panel, I'm guessing you're not super interested in distressed debt right now. So I, I would say all doors are open to you. They all came into the Oak Tree panel a couple of weeks ago. So you're, you're absolutely right. So um, so fair point, guys. Um, uh, let me ask you a couple more rifle fire stuff. Um, favorite interview question? Um, not if we on the spot, but what's your favorite go-to interview question where, where you want to test candidates on? Rohit, you go first. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's actually, it's pretty simple, but it's uh, uh, it's actually pretty revealing, which is, 
Um, if you were to start a, a two person company, um, who would you hire to, to be your complement and why? Uh, and I think what it gets at is it's sort of strengths, weaknesses, and then also personality in like one question. Uh, and what people choose to say uh, in response to it is often as revealing uh, as the content itself. Love it. Um, Tammy, what about you? Love it. I'm going to steal it. Um, so in my interviews, I think Rohit talked about what really matters. That's what TPG is all about. Every single deal, we write a WRM page in each one of our memo, uh, what really matters. It's not the 10 things that are in your normal investment framework. It's what's specific for the deal and what could go wrong after you talk about what really matters. Love it. Sahil, how about you? Um, I like to ask just what, what, what's your favorite business model? <laughs> A, a really nerdy question, but I just think it, it, it helps filter out someone that uh, likes to invest and has thought about a moat for a business before versus someone that um, ha hasn't really thought about what makes a good business versus what doesn't. And I mean, standard answers, I think that pop up are like things like pharmaceutical businesses or something like Google, which is like almost an information services monopoly. Um, but like someone that can articulate why something is a great business um, in a few sentences, uh, kind of to Tammy's point, like, Articulate the what really matters. Uh, I think that that's uh, that's important to see. Super, super helpful. Two more rapid fire ones from our audience. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was really interested in understanding um, the process of pivoting into growth equity um, from like a consulting or investment banking background. What kind of things should um, you try to get exposure to in your stint, either in IB or management consulting? Well, cool. and maybe we could just do two different perspectives. So I hope kind of, uh, we you briefly touched on this, but what did you highlight coming from consulting like that where, you know, in your interviews that were important to highlight? Yeah, um, like I said, I recruited on cycle. So it was, just a, it was a bit of a blur of a process altogether. Um, but like I had done a few private equity due diligences at, at, uh, at BCG and the Warburg uh, interviewers asked me like, okay, for this deal that you looked at, give me the, give me the thesis and considerations. Like, why is it, a, why was it a good investment? Why was it a bad investment? Would you make this investment? Being able to articulate what was on your resume was was probably the most important. Um, in terms of your question on like what things do you want to get exposure to as a management consultant, I think the PE due diligence are definitely good because that gives you a flavor of what you'll be doing um, in the private equity job and gives you something to talk about in interviews as well. Um, the other advice I honestly give consultants though is don't try to tailor your entire management consulting experience to recruiting for private equity um, because there's I, I found the kind of other random experiences you get in consulting are also really valuable. So that would be the other piece of advice I'll leave you with is don't just, don't spend your first two years in a banking consulting job just trying to recruit, but just solely catering your experiences to recruiting for private equity. Totally agree. And Tammy, I think, you know, you came over from Morgan Stanley. So what was important for you to highlight in your deal experience kind of making the switch over to KKR and the, and the growth equity? Um, I think it's, uh, it's the same thing we talk about. If you're a banker, your tendency is to sell and kind of memorize the things on your book. Uh, so what you want to do is over engineer and really think deeply on what could go wrong, whether the things on your book is actually true. And you also want to uh, compare to folks who are analysts at uh, a private uh, analyst at an investment firm. Uh, the bankers tend to have less exposure to the growth equity name. So that's the sourcing part. So you really want to make sure you can bring in new names, not just the companies that you work with. Um, but it's really the, the, the three things we talk about. Source, are you able to source? Are you able to think and support diligence? And are you able to offer up uh, your time and personality and expertise for portfolio support? Amazing. Um, so one thing I will note is our panelists not only are super generous in giving up their time on a Sunday to do this, um, we're also going to be doing like office hours and things like that because there's sort of, you know, uh, to get them to give more, you know, a little bit more time if they, you know, if they're interested in it. I know some of you guys have already talked to me about this. Um, so uh, be on the lookout for that. We'll send that, that out over emails and, and so on and so forth. If, you know, they're just so helpful. We'll maybe do small group, um, you know, AMAs and things like that, you know, Tammy and team for, for anyone that kind of wants more support and, and kind of guidance from them. Um, so with that, we're, um, we're gonna go to the kind of the next and most important part of our discussion here, which is the case study and the firm overview. So, um, uh, and so we'll, we'll turn over the TCB team to do that. Um, but Tammy and Sahil, thank you for jumping on. You guys can, we'll connect with you right afterwards. Okay, um, thank you again so much. I think we've had a lot of comments from the audience. So thanks guys for, for, for coming on.